This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 158 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Monty Roberts University. Horsemanship Radio is part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have some Hall of Famers and a mental skills coach, too. This is Debbie Lauks, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my trusty producer with me today. Hi, Jen. Greetings. How's Debbie in California? Well, if you like stall walkers and stall vices, I'm a good example for it. (laughs) If people could stall walk, crib, and weave... Yeah. I think there are a lot of horse folks out there doing that right now. A lot right? of weaving. A lot of weaving. Yeah. I thought about getting one of those tilt boards. Have you seen those things where you stand up, you know, you put your laptop at counter level and you stand on like a tilt board, you know, and then I thought, no, 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 this is too much like a stall vice. <laughs> <laughs> I might hurt myself. I do actually have one of those balls that, you know, you sit on, but it has wheels on it so that when you sit down, the brakes go on mm-hmm. and, uh, but you kind of wiggle so you around and everything. But sometimes I get bucked off. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yes, occasionally. Nobody's looking, though. We're in quarantine. It's okay. Well, you know, the, the whole world is learning to think outside their box right now. And yeah. in the long term, it's going to be a good thing. In the short term, kind of sucks. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're learning to be patient, aren't we? Actually, I, I think it's really fun. I, a lot of things have come up uh, in the creative world for this, even if, you know, the rest of the world is falling apart. Us, us equestrians, you know, are sequestered. And as we were coming up with some uni lessons and, uh, and thinking of things that people can, skills that they can work on while this uh, sequestering time is going on, I went, well, let's just shorten that to sequestrians. <laughs> and we started a hashtag campaign called sequestrians. And now we're we're actually practicing our knots, like our bowling and our, you know, quick releases and our clove hitch. And, and those are the three most important. Write that down. Those are the three most important. I didn't know. Equestrian. Yeah, you'll use those all the time. Like if you're, you know, if you're kind of new to this whole equestrian business, um, make sure that you go and whether it's on the online university or it's on YouTube, go figure out because a, a lot of these knots, you know, are nautical. So you can find a lot of great explanations on how to how to uh, learn to do That's those. That's a knots. very good point now that you bring that up because mm-hmm. there, I've, I came across, it might have been a Cub Scout or Boy Scout website or something, but now that I know they're on the university, you need to go over there because they're directly applicable, applicable to horse people. But there are knots that are designed to take tension and not get too tight so that you can still open them. Mm-hmm. There mm-hmm. are knots that aren't really knots, but they hold things as long as they're under tension, but not at all if they're not under tension. Very mm-hmm. interesting. That's a good thing to do. So you go over to Monty Roberts University. Now, if they if somebody wants to find those those lessons and they're listening to this show in uh, April of 2028, what's mm-hmm. a good word to search for? <laughs> in the future. Uh, search for knots. I mean, just not will do it because they we do have them in a couple of different places in different ways because, you know, you kind of have to think how you think. And one of the lessons I was watching this morning is join up for children. So you wouldn't think about knots there, right? But we teach little Emma. We teach her how to tie up her horse. And we do do a basic little quick release knot. Uh, but, it, it, you know, it's not super exploratory on how to do that knot. It's more about why we have a quick release knot and, mm-hmm. and how far from your horse's muzzle, you know, should it be and Those things like that. Those are important things. Cause right. Too, too long is bad and too short is just as bad. Yeah. Right. That's right. Um, but then the bowling, you know, is a more complicated knot. And that goes all the way to the advanced level because of course when you've got a horse that's untouched and maybe we've got and we're doing a gentling wild horse course then you've got a horse in a chute and that horse is going to avoid you reaching over its neck at all costs (laughs) and they squeeze up against the other side of the chute and it's really hard to get the horse to just start to be you know nose a little bit closer to you because they don't trust you you know and they shouldn't yet Um, because we've just rounded them up somewhere and you know one of those BLM you know, 
holding life pins. Is, so like, yeah, their their human to horse oh. interactions have not been pleasant thus far. Yeah. yeah, not been pleasant at all. Yeah, and they don't. We don't deserve their trust. But we will slip a little rope over their neck. So people will be like, "Why would you put a rope around a horse's neck?" Well, what we want to do is start having them yield to pressure a little bit. So the type of knot that you want to do in that case, they're safe in a in a in a chute, is a bowline. And that is a wonderful knot that you'll find so many uses around the barn with. But the reason it's such a good one is it doesn't, once you tie the knot in the loop that you've created, it doesn't tighten down. Oh, so you're never going to be able to choke the horse. Yeah, yeah, no, on any animal. I mean, this is the one you can use on your dog if you can't find your leash or something because you can't tighten your, it down. Your, your four-year-old nephew. Yeah. <laughs> Put that <laughs> right around that little guy's waist. Yeah. Yeah, it's around his waist. That's a good idea. But anyway, that's and it, you could tow with that thing, and it doesn't tighten down so that you can't undo it either. So in case of when you've got a really fractious horse in there and you now need to get it undone, you know, um, it's very easy to to pull apart too. So you know, so a clove hitch, you know, that that one everybody should know that that's a great one to. Um, let's say you're going to go out on a trail ride and you've got a halter on your horse and you've got a lead and you want to be able to tie up at lunch, you know, so you leave the halter under the bridle and the lead on there goes back to your horn if you've got a horn and you um you know just put a little clove on it and it's it can un untighten it can loose up really easily but it'll stay locked down on that horn oh, i need to learn that so one. that it stays anyway oh yeah it's a great one yeah, it's a great one, one too so and clove hitch we use all over so those three for equestrians a quick release a bowlin and a clove hitch um are critical and so we were just filming some of those things for us sequestrians um, to practice because not everybody, um, you know, a lot of us do the quick release as we tie our horses up and carefully, but um, not everybody practices that bowling, but it's a good one to have because you know what else you can do with the bowling? Let's say you you're out in the pasture and you realize that you either forgotten your halter or it's broken. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's go with it broken. <laughs> but you can, you can flip that lead around the neck, tie a quick bowling. Remember, it's not going to tighten down. Then you can take, if it's long enough, you can take a little wrap around the muzzle and you've got a makeshift halter. You've got an instant Yay. halter. That's a good one to have because horse mm -hmm. folks, we're always, we always have a lead rope, a piece of bale or twine, a rope in yeah. general, if not a halter too in our vehicles, right? That's what we right. do. And invariably there's some point where you need to get something mm -hmm. caught and you need to do it in a hurry and you're mm -hmm. using that piece of rope or lead that you have stuffed under the back seat of your car yep. and knowing that not could really make the difference between getting an animal to safety and not Good yeah idea. what are the chances of this my mom and i were driving through washington state this is years ago what are the chances that we're driving through this um, kind of rural area and we see a horse on the road it oh, got out and we see the open gate yeah i know these people never knew it because they're so lucky that two horsewomen got out of the car <laughs> And and caught this horse, but the the horse had a broken halter around the neck. I don't don't ask me. I don't know the story. We put him back, took the halter off, hung it on the on the gate, and left. Wow. But but you know we were able to stop that horse. You know, do a little quick lead halter, <laughs> emergency halter kind of thing, and lead it back to the to the open gate and put it back in the pasture. And you, you know. It, that knowledge just in your fingertips and your muscle memory, you know, just creates a very yeah. calm moment. Well, yeah. yeah. And in, in that situation, that emergency high energy situation is not the time to go. Now, how do you do that? Not muscle yeah. memory. That's good. <laughs> I like it. And speaking of uh, giant brains and muscle memory, Tanya mm -hmm. Johnson's going to come on shortly and talk about keeping our brains well exercised and using them creatively and effectively to become better horsemen. But before we do that, we're going to hear from a lady by the name of Kathy Ward, and she's going to tell us a little bit about why she uses the Equus Online University and why she loves it so much. Imagine if you could take Monty to the barn with you. Watch and learn as he addresses each challenge with your horse and answers your questions, too. You head to the arena and you work on each new lesson, knowing Monty's there to encourage you, all with violence-free, tried-and-true methods. After all, he's been helping train horse lovers all his life. With his online university, you could be like Kathy, a retired teacher who just brought her first horse. Recently, I went to a tack shop to look for a smaller halter. I'm 61, just purchased my 14 hands POA the day after my birthday, just a few weeks ago. 
after never having had a horse. And yes, that's crazy. But as a retired teacher who never had a hobby other than teaching, I decided to go for it. My hubby and I have taken lessons this past year, but I really longed for a relationship with a horse. Um, The only other experience I'd ever had was to ride a horse in Philly, Pennsylvania, my hometown, when I was 16, and I got bucked off. And that was it (laughs) until I was 61. Um, Well, the owner of this tax shop, um, this is precious lady, 84-year-old lady, gave me a copy of this magazine, Equine Monthly. And the article I read in it was Horses Are Biofeedback Beings. And it was just so interesting. I really felt like I just found a pot of gold when I read it because in it, it talked about Monty's online university and that I could have access to 575 videos for $10 a month. And before that, I was just searching YouTube for everything I could find. But truthfully, that's just a pain. Um, I love that the uni videos are concise and they're in order. Um, They have extra notes and a quiz. And I just can't thank you enough for the huge blessing of your online university. It really has changed my life and I will never be the same. Um, I've had my horse Jack now for seven weeks and Thanks to the videos, I've done join up with him, and it really worked like a dream. Uh, I had to do it in an arena, but it still worked. Thanks to Monty's lessons and the cues and the hand signals, um, the ability to watch the lessons over and over on demand is incredible. So I also want to thank you so very much for making the online university affordable for this retired teacher. Thank you so much for all that you do for everyone who really wants to love a horse. Kathy. Tanya Johnston is a mental skills coach with a master's degree in sports psychology who specializes in work with equestrian athletes. She offers performance enhancement skills education to assist riders in achieving excellence with their horse. Tanya helps riders apply mental skills in a variety of equestrian disciplines, including dressage, three-day eventing, and hunter jumpers. She offers group clinics and individual phone or in-person appointments for riders. Well, welcome, Tanya Johnston and Monty Roberts. I'm so glad to have you on. I thank you for being on the show today to share your wisdom. I spoke with both of you separately about what you wanted to impart today. And uh, I guess in a word, you both spoke about synchronicity. But I thought I'd start with you, Tanya. You spoke about being there and present horses and and I, and I, and Monty, I'll, I'll throw that in there. Dad spoke about being fair with your horse and um, focusing on his needs. So, Tanya, tell me a little bit more about where you see the uh, parallels in your work. Well, I think, I don't know if it's so much as parallels as understanding the little bit that I do about your work, Monty, around wanting there to be clear and clean communication and that that sort of is our goal of being in the present moment and being able to listen to our horses. And in the work I do with riders, you know, I, I work just with the riders and and not with the horses. So I am helping them have tools and routines to get themselves to quiet their mind, to get themselves to be really what I call, you know, standing in their boots, like to be where their feet are and be in the moment and be able to then be more available to be in synchrony with their horse and to the ebb and flow of the communication that it can be smooth and consistent and that they can, the rider that can then be the most present and available to their horse. And Monty, um, how do you expand on that? Yeah. Well, I can expand on that. First of all, by saying that I disagree with Tanya very strongly and remember that I say your critics are your best friends Mm -hmm. but I disagree with Tanya in that she said I don't work with the horses I work with the riders and Mm -hmm. I say that whether she knows it or not if she's working with the riders to make them better with their horses she's working with the horses Uh Right, right and if they could vote If the horses could see through the clouds, 
Somebody mm-hmm. out there is fixing this problem I have. Mm-hmm. Gosh, I really appreciate them. Then you're working with the horse. Yeah. That's good. So let's put yeah. some tools in our listeners' tool bags because we know that uh, to the person who only owns a hammer, everything pretty much looks like a nail, right? <laughs> so, right. T- Tanya, what do you say to the student who asks how they could compete as well as they practice? Well, it's it's a lot around having uh, strong and consistent self-awareness so that you're able to make good choices, right? That you're, that you're able to be in uh, a state where you're present, your breathing is smooth, your, your thoughts are, like I said, that your thoughts are quiet. If you've had to memorize a test or a pattern, we've done all of that work to where when we get with the horse, you're able to really get to a place of trust and partnership and um, really to just be then available to for the communication because that's you know so much what we're doing with our horses is 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 that that back and forth communication and that openness and if we come to especially in competition we come to it with too many thoughts about what has to happen and um, trying to force things or riding for a score or you know having goals that are um, very specifically outcome oriented, we cut ourselves off from the experience of the moment a lot. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I do is work with riders on just really dialing in their self-awareness and, and, and figuring out what works for them. You know, everyone's different, just like every horse is different. Every rider's different and what's going to help them um, be the most confident and um, calm and centered um, rider that they can be. And so that may take, you know, um, different kinds of, uh, breathing techniques that may be, um, doing some sort of, of exercise, stretching body awareness that they can do because so often I think riders bring, and I, I'm sure Monty can speak to this. I mean, I would, I would guess I I wouldn't, I shouldn't say I'm sure, but just as riders, I think so many people bring so much tension or stress or, uh, uh, rigidity in their bodies that they're not even aware of. Right. So we, it's really a a task as a rider to understand yourself, to know what your tendencies are and to know what, um, if there is stress in the environment or you are feeling stress about a certain day or certain competition, you know, where's that likely to show up and, and what can you do to help get rid of it before your horse is right there standing with you or, or you're riding them and, and you two are one. You know, Debbie is here, and she's our hostess, and um, Mm. Debbie has heard my dialogues all of her life, Mm. and wasn't that just an incredible uh, microcosm of what I have said for my Mm. entire existence, Debbie? Mm. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. I use the term diaphragmatic breathing. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. because I think that's what you're speaking of. Yes. The relaxation of the relaxation of the diaphragm so that the lungs have more space and that lowers the adrenaline and it lowers the pulse rates. Right. Um, so the horse is advantaged. And uh have you ridden some and in, in, in competition, uh Tanya? Yes, I do. I ride in the, the hunter jumper world. So I, I've ridden, uh, my whole life. I started when I was four and, um, have a horse now and we do the amateur owner hunters and we do derbies and, uh, things like that. So yeah. So I'm very blessed. Yeah. Have you had some successes? Yeah. Yep. I have. And I definitely came to this from, from a, a growing up, uh, where I, I had definitely mixed, results and always found myself curious about why I rode better on, on certain days than others. And I did not own my own horses growing up. I had, my family was supportive, but we had limited 
you know, means. And so I would often ride sail horses or catch ride horses or be getting on horses I didn't know. And, and yet I'd still see some consistent fluctuations in my own performance, even given the, the difference in, in horses that I was sitting on. And so it was really intriguing to me. So I was always very interested, you know, why is that, right? The horses are different. And yet I see the same pattern. I would always sort of ride better on, on the last day. And even on horses that I'd ridden several times, I'd ride better on the last day. And I was like, well, what am I working through? What's changing? What's different? So that's where my interest in psychology and then sports psychology in my master's degree, um, where that came from. So I'm very lucky to be able to blend my passion with my, my fascination with performance and, uh, helping people, make the most of themselves and their potential and, um, and being able to join with these magnificent animals that we get to work with. Wow. I, I sent a carload of synchronicity here. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> we, 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 re, we really are speaking from the same megaphone. And um, have, have you ever been around Verity? Do you know what the, the species Verity is? Mm-mm. Uh, that's the deer and antelope. Oh, okay. H- have you ever been around them much? I, mm, I mean, we have plenty of deer here in California, but not around them to the extent, like, in consistent proximity, no. Yeah. Well, I think you'll realize that if a horse is a flight animal and we could score their 1 to 10 as flighty, Mm-hmm. I think I think it's fair to say that I personally could give the horse about a five and a half or six. Mm. And what would I give the deer and antelope? I would mm. have to give them a 10 because they are, without any question, the flightiest, most sensitive animals to flight on the face of this earth. So they would earn all of the points. And if you have somebody teaching you something and they're coming at you with information from the tens, it's a much better learning curve that you exist with than if they're coming at you with the five and a half or a six, if indeed I'm right about scoring them. And Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty close. I've been working with the same family group of deer for 49 years now. Wow. And uh, I know a lot of them by name, not that they know their names. But, um, for instance, all of the universities that I've spoken at or I have visited or I have taken courses in, all of the universities have said that in the behavioral science world of animal behavior, you cannot touch the wild deer that has never been in captivity or in an enclosure of some sort. And the explanation for that is that you can't approach them enough to show them that it's okay, Hmm. enter their bubble, for instance, uh, so that you, when they're in the wild, you cannot get close enough to show them it's okay for you to get close. So you cannot touch the wild deer. Would you agree with that? Just uh, out of your thoughts that you have... I mean, it it sounds. I mean, I would, I would imagine, since you're asking the question, that I would imagine you have, but I could see most mortals not being able to do that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and and I have uh, touched probably a hundred, a hundred and fifty. Wow. Currently, it's currently it's about eight at this moment in time. Mm-hmm. But, but I've been through uh, forty nine years of this. And yet my first animal, my first deer to touch was grandma. And that goes back, uh, about 41, 42 years, but I worked to touch her for two years before Mm -hmm. I could touch her. And, um, then I read things from certain behaviorists that say the eyes don't make a difference. Uh, Where you look, this Monty Roberts guy says, don't put your eyes here, don't put your eyes there, then put your eyes here and put your eyes there. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But it doesn't matter. We've done tests to show empirically that it doesn't matter where your eyes go. Horses don't look at your eyes. And yet, I can show you how I can actually move deer predictably um, with my eyes and cause them to do things that I will predict with my eyes. And if you can do it with deer, then you mm-hmm. can do it with horses, and I can prove it that way too. Right. Uh, the eyes make a tremendous difference because mm-hmm. ours are on the front of our heads, which makes us a predator. And mm-hmm. theirs are on the side of their head, which makes them a flight animal. And the eyes are terrifically important. And then I've gone around to these universities and given a lot of talks. And so far, it's over a thousand kids that I've talked to or young people that I've talked to in the universities. And I have one person that raised their hand and actually knew the definition of positive thigmotaxis. Do you know that? definition of positive. No, <laughs> no I'm for You're getting sure tested don't. here. <laughs> yeah, it's a test. Well, it's the most important, in my opinion, it's the most important behavioral action of horses, thigmotaxis, positive thigmotaxis. Mm. Um, and that is that that is the reason why they ride dressage horses for two or three years before they ask them for flying changes. Why is that? Because you're going to ask them with your right leg to take a left lead. Are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. And when you ask them with your right leg, you're going to drop it back and sort of press just behind their ribs with your right leg to get a left lead. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So with positive thigmotaxis, their rear quarters are going to go into that leg. And their front quarters are going to go with the reins, and you have disunited horses leading in left in front and right behind. And my God, we don't want to make our dressage horses disunited. So we ride them for two or three years. I now have learned that at about 12 months of age, I do a certain procedure, and I can cause horses to be trained off pressure rather than on pressure. And if you walk up to the young horse and stick your thumb in his ribs, you might get kicked and he will come into you, not away from you. That's positive thigmotaxis, into pain, uh, okay. not away from pain. And you ask yourself, why did Mother Nature ever do that? Well, when the dog bites into the flank, so if the horse bolts away, All the dog has to do is put his feet in the ground and rip, and then the whole pack eats lunch. If the horse goes into the dog and kicks him in the head, then he can get away because the dog will open his mouth. So survival of the fittest for 50 million years has created the horse into pressure. And you would ask yourself, Why would Mother Nature do that? And we are away from pain, aren't we? Right. Okay, we're away from pain. Not completely. If you've raised any children or you've been around children when they're bringing their teeth in and the gums get really sore and it's painful as hell, what do they want to do? Chew. They want to chew on a rubber ring. That is positive thigmotaxis in our mouth. And you ask yourself, why would Mother Nature make us want to go into pain in our mouth? And then you say, where did the dentist live when we lived in the caves? Oh, there was no dentist when we lived in the caves. So if we broke a tooth and we wouldn't go into pain, we wouldn't eat. And then we would die. And those that would go into pain in the mouth live, and that's called survival of the fittest, and we're Mm. thigmotaxic in our mouth. But not, I've had one student with all of these equine science courses that they have in the universities. I've had one student that remembered well reading it because Zonophon wrote about it 2,000 years ago, that thigmotaxis is probably the single most important behavioral pattern 
uh, within the horse. And you will know it as left rein, right rein, left foot, right foot. You will know it as even your backside just shifting a tiny bit in the saddle. Um, Thigmotaxis is something you have to deal with. And each of our horses that go into competition ought to learn to go off pressure instead of on pressure. I mean, you could train them to go into pressure. Mm -hmm. You don't have to train them. They're, they're already there. But if you lived in their world, you could do it their way if you could get the human to think that way. But in the heat of competition, the human will think human. So it's right. better to let the horses, the horses are better at learning. So uh, they can learn to go <laughs> off pressure easier than we can learn right. to live on pressure. Right, exactly. Silly this is being story, fair to the it? horse. No, I, I love being fair to the horse. So I think this is falling into that category that uh, all three of us have talked about, about sort of blaming our horse for being like a horse instead of just working with our horse's nature, working with those things that are already built in there long before, you know, we came around just a few million years ago, you know, it, so it's really only been what six thousand years that we've really had domesticated animals. Yeah. Um, so, so really, it's it's a bit of an imposition <laughs> that we put put on our horses to say right. that I bet, you should I bet, do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I bet Tanya could tell us that she tells people all the time, "Don't blame your horse. Look to yourself and figure out what you're doing that's causing this problem." Do you do that, Tanya? Yeah, I don't, you know, it's funny. I don't even, I, the people that it's a little bit self-selection, right? So people who would come and seek me out are already under the understanding that they are a big part of the puzzle. And so uh -huh. do you see what I'm saying? So I don't have many clients who come to me and say, well, my horse, you know, I guess I, I guess I do sometimes I'll ask them to look at their language a lot, right? If someone says my horse threw me, it's mm -hmm. like, Hmm, did it? Did it really, or did you, did you fall off? You know, it's sort of, it, it, anyway, just looking at sort of the intricacies of how we conceptualize what happens with our horses. And, and I think that's part of what you're saying around blame is, is very important. And it's, it's very much reflective of how we see the communication, right. And how we, uh, take like the information that goes back and forth, that's, there's no real blame with that. You're putting forth information. They're putting forth, inf sometimes the wires get crossed, but, but really there's no, there's no blame. And, you know, sometimes there's just, there's confusion that needs to be sorted out. It's just plain and simple. What you talk about with how the eyes are so important. And I understand I can envision, I haven't watched you work uh, very much, but I've watched some online at, I can, I imagine on when you're on the ground with the horse, can you speak to the importance of the eyes when you're riding the horse? Because that's something I do talk about, and I'm curious your take on that well, and how you talk about that. Yeah, when you're in the saddle, Tanya, and um, you look at a fence, let's say I'll go into your world, you look at a fence that's slightly off 45 degrees to your right. Mm -hmm. and your eyes go over to that fence, believe me, the horse knows where your eyes go. Oh, right. Mr. Robert, the <laughs> horse can't see your eyes? No. But your eyes are connected to your sartorius on both sides. That's the inner muscle of your thighs, which are the closest thing to his back. And leather is the greatest transmitter of signals on the face of the earth. It goes right through the leather. I don't know how. Down <laughs> to your knee, something, I don't know. But I do know that when, let's say, a horse is approaching this gap between the fences and your fence is off to your right, I do know that when your eyes go to that fence, that that horse will change to the right lead and square himself up on that fence. Mm -hmm. Try it. You'll see that it's true. But I don't think he sees your eyes. He can't, he can't look back over his back. His eyes are on the side of his head, but he has a blank spot behind his neck. Right. But he feels your impulses in your body 
to a greater extent than we could ever even imagine the sensitivity of feel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they, and they know that when you're on the ground, if you just fiddle with your horse a little bit and be looking at his front feet, you can see the whole horse when you look at his front feet and where his front feet are, you know, the whole horse from there. So if you're looking at his front feet and fiddling around, sending him away from you in a little pen or something, just keep looking at the front feet. And all of a sudden, then snap your eyes up to his eyes, and you will see a horse change like day and night. Mm -hmm. They will brace. They will get ready. You are then a predator. And when it's on the eyes, they will take action to see that they're in a safe place. When it's on the front feet... They will give you the benefit of the doubt that you're not going to be a predator. Mm. And Try and for, no, absolutely. No, I hear what you're saying, and I think it's interesting when we talk about if you talk about nerves or anxiety sometimes that a rider may feel or nervous anticipation in a competitive situation that 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 rider's eyes might be darting around, might be not very yep. focused, may not be very, you know, steady, and that the horse then is getting so much information from that, correct? Absolutely. And the mm -hmm. eyes are connected to every nerve in your body. So it's your body that's telling them through the saddle uh, what you're up to if it's riding them. If you're on the ground and away from them, and your eyes are darting around, they're still uneasy with that because they can literally see your eyes. And yeah. I can have, I can have uh, Ruby up with her head within a foot of my, my hands or my knees, and I can be rubbing her on the neck and the top of her head. That's a deer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm looking down sort of past her nose to her front feet and I'm rubbing and she's happy with me. She, she likes to have her ears scratched and stuff. And if I snap my eyes, if I quickly snap my eyes onto her eyes, I not only can move her away from me with a uh, very nervous movement, but I can move the whole herd. Mm. They will all take wow. offense yeah. to it. And how in the hell, are all of them looking at my <laughs> eyes? Well, they're not. But what they're doing is reading the tenseness of the other individuals. And then mm. the whole herd goes. Right. Uh, I, did, I did it just yesterday unintentionally and uh, bothered me a lot because uh, I'm not supposed <laughs> to be unintentional these days. But um, you make mistakes. And right. it took me a it took me about a half an hour. When I used to make mistakes with grandma, the first one I ever touched, it would take me a week to get back where I was before. And it would be two or three hours every night after dark working with her before she let me touch her again. So when, when you're dealing with the ultra sensitive animal, uh, they're the best teachers on the face of the earth because they charge you a big price when you get it wrong. That's yeah. Right. This reminds mm. me of what do you say to the person who complains that their horse knows the difference between the practice ring and the show ring? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was going to tell that one, Debbie, because we just got a, uh, an, a question last week for the Q&A that I do for the Internet. And the person said, oh, this horse is just terrible. And I finally got her so that she's OK in the warm up ring. But as soon as you ride in and they and we're in competition, then she just stops at the first fence and she won't go. Wow! Well, my really intelligent horse, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> this is Tanya's world. This is Tanya's yeah. world. It, that horse is, uh, you know, just been telegraphed to by right. that, uh, yep. that rider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so For much. Sure. I, I listened to a podcast of yours, Tanya, um, and we should let people know where your podcast is too, but about learning to surf in Costa Rica recently. Oh, yeah. And I, I thought it was good because I thought uh, I, what I liked that you, um, you were edifying was the fact that people should go out and learn a different kind of skill set or a sport or whatever. And uh, you talked a lot about breathing, talked mm -hmm. about using different muscles and, and doing something different. So in some ways, dad's talking about, um, expanding your horse skills with something that just has more flight mechanism than, right. than a typical horse might 
might do. But anyway, right. fascinating talk, you all. And um, yeah. we will have to make this a, a bit of a, <laughs> yeah, a regular. Me, I'd love to. <laughs> let me quickly say that the conclusion of that story that we got about the horse that knew it was when it was in a competition, mm-hmm. uh, it, uh, they ultimately put a man on it. And then this didn't happen at all. And the horse was winning and everything. Huh. So they've now concluded that the, the horse just doesn't like women. It, it only <laughs> likes men. <God. laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's oh, it. Dear. That's it. Yeah. Well, thank you both. I, I think yeah. this was fascinating. And I, you know, I loved getting two brains like this. The, we've got one horse brain. I'd be Monty. <laughs> and then we've got Tanya, who, who so is uh, empathetic and, and wonderful as a coach, too, with people and, and, and horses. So, uh, well, we have I to get together to more. We have to get yeah. together more closely and, 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 uh, and study some of these things. I, I really congratulate you for the work you're doing. Oh, thank you so much. It was an honor to be uh, here in conversation with you. Thank you for having me. This was great. Cavallo hoof boots are easy to get on and stay on in all types of terrain and activities. Unique drainage slots allows water to drain out quickly, and they are super easy to take off too. With Cavallo's, you spend your time on the trail with your best friend, not wasting time putting on complicated hoof boots. Cavallo hoof boots come in three durable upper options and two sole widths. You get confidence and security with their best boot ironclad warranty. Cavallo hoof boots take you where you want to go. Jack Roddy was born in San Francisco and was raised and calls home San Jose now. He attended Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo, graduating with a degree in animal husbandry. He joined the Cal Poly Rodeo team in 1957 and secured the National Intercollegiate Rodeo Association All-Around Cowboy in his first year. Roddy became a powerful force in steer wrestling in the early 1960s. He went to the National Finals Rodeo for the first time in 1962, and in 1966, he won the World Champion Steer Wrestling in 1966 and 68, setting a record for total earnings in that event. Jack is a rodeo world champion, athlete, entrepreneur, mentor, and philanthropist now. He owns and operates Roddy Ranch Golf Course and Cattle Company, and he's been happily married to his beautiful wife, Donna, for over 32 years. Well, welcome back. I am so excited to have both Jack Roddy and Monty Roberts back on the line together. The last time we had you two um, gallivanting on this podcast, you were talking about Cal Poly days and some old fun jokes and pranks that you were pulling on people, and people can go back to that episode. It was really funny. But I, I thought we'd be a little more serious today and talk about during, um, you know, these sequestered times, uh, what are you guys' plans? What are you doing with horses? What are you doing with the future? Now, you're you're young. You're both in your 80s, so you got a ways to go. Suck it up. And um, we want to know what you're doing spending time at home. Go ahead, Jack. You tell you tell them. Well, I'm staying home. We, uh, we can't leave the house right now with all this the coronavirus, but... Uh, we're on a ranch, so I don't get around too good anymore. I had a horse buck me off and <clears throat> broke some ribs and hurt my back. But my wife does most of the cowboying. Uh, we run about a thousand head of cattle here in the ranch, and uh, she does most of the riding. And I do give the orders as much as I can. And I stay pretty close to the house, to tell you the truth. Well, good for Donna. That's for good for Donna out there on her horse, yeah. But uh, God, we got to, yeah, thank God you've got her, and we got to keep her on the middle of the saddle and not get yep. her bucked off, too. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, Monty, what are you doing down on the farm? I hope you're there right now. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I'm here locked down in my house, but I have one huge advantage, and that is that our yard is pretty much, you know, to ourselves all around us. We've got enough space around us. And uh, for 49 years now, I've been working with the same family group of deer, not working with them like uh, you would a horse, but just learning from them because they are the flightiest animals on earth and horses are flight animals too. And so learning their behavior, they've taught me so much and I can sit out there with them and they come around and say hello to me. I can name them for you and so forth. Uh, But 
one of the things that I've done is to spend a lot of time thinking about my oldest of friends. And I believe John Roddy was an immigrant from Ireland, or at least he was a child when he got here or something. Jack, what was that? Monty, my dad was born in Ireland, and he was, uh, they did a, a movie about my life called Cowboys in Ireland, done six or seven years ago. And we went back with Chris Cox, myself, and four or five of us, and went back to the family farm. And our family, uh, the farm that we had in Ireland is 40 acres, and they farmed there for 400 years. And when my wow. dad was a kid, he uh, was the first guy in his area to use a horse to farm with. And my father always loved horses and loved the West. He had an uncle that that used to write from California about cowboys and Indians. My dad's father got killed in the mines in Butte, Montana, when he worked there during the famine in Ireland to feed the family. So my dad only had a fourth grade education, but he loved the West. And he finally got enough money to uh, get to San Francisco, and he wound up, he bought a little 12 stool beer and wine bar in downtown San Francisco. And eventually that turned out to the longest bar in the world. He bought, he had four bars in San Francisco, but he met our first world champion. His name was Charlie McGinney, and Monty knows all about him. He was a great cowboy, our first world champion in 1929, steer roper and team roper, and got my dad interested in the West. And uh, and my dad had a rodeo grounds in Coma, in South San Francisco, where they put on rodeos. Harry Rowell used to supply the stock when I was just a, a year or two old. And uh, my father and a guy named... Bill Cresta financed the first and only rodeo at the World's Fair at Treasure Island, I think in the 30s or whatever date it was. And anyway, my dad loved the West. He bought a ranch then in San Jose, and that's where I was raised on the ranch in San Jose. Well, let me tell you that I first met John Roddy, Jack's dad, I think it was 1949, and we met under very tedious situations in that I bought a horse from a guy in Hollister, and uh, his name was Chongo, this horse, and I brought him to Salinas, and I was so proud of him, I got him for $1,500, and I used money that I earned stunt doing stunts in the films, and I uh, $1,500 for Chongo, and I got him home, and I said, well, look at this. I got me a three or $4,000 horse. He's going to be a champion. Oh, man, I fell in love with him in about three days. And John Roddy, I'm going to say now, Jack might correct me, but by that time, he was doing really well, and he had a great big old car to drive, and he was a big man anyway with a big voice, and he came driving in my yard and parked there and got out. It took him five minutes to stand up. He was so big, that is to say, as I remember it. <laughs> and he said, what is that horse? And I said, that's Chongo. That's my horse. He said, I don't know who you are, but I've watched you in some horse shows and you do good. I don't think you're a dishonest man, but that's my horse. And I said, no, 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 this is my horse. Uh, I bought him. I paid him, paid $1,500 for him. He said, you bought him from a trainer, and I'm not going to name the trainer, but you bought him from a trainer that I had him in training with. And uh, the guy needed some money to get him some more alcohol or something, and uh, he sold him to me for 1500 Now, John Roddy was a gentleman. And he gave me my 1500 back. Now, whether he got it from that other guy or out of his hide, I'm not sure. He took Chongo away. And when do you think the next time was that I saw Chongo? That was about 1949. The next time I saw Chongo was about 1955. 
When did you come to Cal Poly, Jack? I think in Monty in 56. And El okay. Chongo, El Chongo, that year in, in 59 in Cal Poly, I bulldogged on El Chongo, and you <laughs> rode him. And yeah. his mother was Habilina P., was an old okay. daughter at Driftwood. And yeah. they were our team. And that year I won seven collegiate championships in a row bulldogging on him with his mother on the other side, Hazen. Hazen for him, yeah. Well, here I am, 1956. That's the year Pat and I got married. Chongo shows up in my life again with this guy even taller than his father was uh, called Jack Roddy, but he was just a kid to me because he's three or four years younger than me. Well, wait a minute. And, you, uh, met me, you met me well before that. Well, yeah. Because Go ahead. Because the first time I met you, I showed a horse against you at Salinas when yeah. I was nine years old in the junior <laughs> stock horse class at Salinas. Yeah. Did you beat me? No. No. I could <laughs> show a horse. I was more interested in riding bucking horses, and you were too yeah. handy. In those days, you won everything. Yeah, well, well, I was spending more time doing that than anything else, so it wasn't right. in, that I was better than anybody, but I was a professional when I was about six years old. That's but right. anyway, the next time I met Chongo, he, he re-entered my life, and he was not that three or $4,000 horse that I thought he was. On today's basis in in rodeo, what would Chongo have been worth? Oh hell, one hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, you could do everything. He'd be a, we we roped on him, we bulldogged on him, we did everything on that horse. Yeah, and outstanding. And up and down the road we went, Jack and I, and then I graduated earlier, and Jack went on, and then just won championship after championship. And he kind of became a politician, Jack Roddy. <laughs> and he started he started in he started inviting uh, politicians to come to his place and come to jackpot ropings and stuff like that. And he became very popular with the Washington D.C. crowd. You know, probably he was going to be president before it was over. But mm-hmm. but Jack Roddy, how many world championships did you win in the PRCA? Well, I won six world championships. I won the intercollegiate all-around championship at Cal Poly and the steer wrestling in 1959. That was a year after you won it. I won the steer wrestling in 59 and uh-huh. all-around. And I won the world championship in the PRCA in 66 and 68. And then in 1992, 91 and 92, I won the world championship in the steer wrestling in the National Seniors Rodeo Association. Uh huh. Are you a senior yet? Yeah, you still a senior, aren't you? <laughs> I'm way past that. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be past that. I'm past being a senior. I'm Jack, not, I know well, that you. I'm like you is old. <laughs> Stag, you received the Ben Johnson Memorial Award too in 2016. That's pretty recent uh, from the Rodeo Historical yes, Society. Did. Yeah, tell us a little bit about how that came about. Well, the Ben Johnson Award was started many years ago. Ben Johnson was a a rodeo great. He was a world champion team roper, did a lot of movies, won an Academy Award, Mm -hmm. the movie The Last Picture Show. But anyway, after he passed away, they decided to have the Ben Johnson Award. The criteria was that you had to be a, a... champion in and out of the arena have done a lot of things in your life and it was started i don't know probably 20 years ago Mm -hmm. and the only people that vote there was 10 of us that funded a bronze that sits now in the uh, rodeo hall of fame in oklahoma city and we built a, a big bronze dedicated to ben johnson Nice. And then every year, as the ten of us, uh, and they were notables, Dale Smith, Mel Potter, uh, we selected a person, and I think the first person to win it was Senator Clem McSpadden, who was Will Rogers' 
nephew won it, Dale Smith, and then on and on, and then anybody that won it would have a right to vote. So I always said it was the, to me, it was the Heisman Rodeo, mm. because it's not what you won, but people that had influence on the sport and the industry and so forth, and then finally I won it, okay, what, two or three years ago. Yep. 2016. Yep, at the National Cowboy and and Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City. So if people want to visit that there, it's that's a that's quite an honor. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, it was it was quite a time to travel with um Jack uh for Cal Poly. Uh we had quite a few people involved with us at that time that went on, uh Greg Ward being one of them. Uh, I so remember uh, Greg Ward came to school there with a with a three hundred and fifty dollar horse, and he got a saddle with him. He's from Bakersfield, California. <laughs> had a tractor roll over on his head, and and uh, he had no lateral vision, and he wanted to be a champion on these working cow horses. And he asked me to start helping him, and I was trying to help him there at the arena at Cal Poly. And I remember we had a guy named Bill Stroud that was on our team, and I, Bill came driving by one day, and I said, look, Bill, what I'm doing here, there sits a kid out there, Greg Ward on Blackie's $350 horse, and he wants to be a champion working cow horse, and what am I going to do? He he can barely ride, and he can't see past center on his right eye. Uh, how, how am I ever going to do this? And uh, three hundred and fifty dollar horse to boot, and he said, "Monty, Blackie is that horse's name, and he's Greg Ward's horse, and Blackie's out there teaching him more than you could teach him. <laughs> so you get busy and try to teach him as much as Blackie's teaching him, and you might make a winner out of him." Nice. And I think at last count, Greg Ward dead now of cancer, won 16 world championships in the working cow horse division. Way more than me, way more than Jack even, and we thought we were about as good as it comes. Greg just kept working at it. And you kids out there listening, no matter what you think your chances are, you bear down, you learn, listen to your horses, learn from your animals. You might be the champion that Greg Ward was. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say something about that. When I went to Cal Poly, Greg Ward wore bib overalls and brogan shoes. He could hardly spell horse when we first went to Cal Poly. Yeah. And he hazed for me and rode my bulldog and horse and with you and I and Greg and so forth. But he wasn't born a cowboy. No. Uh, but through hard work and learning he become to me one of the greatest horsemen and i remember greg ward uh i found out he had cancer and we flew to the hawaiian islands in january and i roped with him in the hawaiian islands he healed for me and we team roped together he had a big u.s roping in hawaii that was in january and that fall was the Snaffle bit fraternity at Fresno. Yeah. And he called me up. Uh, there was five of us, Bobby Adair, the jockey, five people. And he said, I want to be my guest. And we went down to Fresno, Monty. It was in the Coliseum. And I said, how's Greg doing? He's outside with his doctor. Yeah. And by then, he was in bad shape. And 90 back, pounds. Yeah. And he's back there with his doctor. And I thought, oh, my God, poor Greg. We stood up in the grandstand, and he showed a horse. Unbelievable. I look back at sports, and a couple of things that I thought were great was was uh, Freckles Brown was a 47-year-old man, rode a bull at Oklahoma City at the national finals called Tornado that had never been ridden. And the other greatest thing I ever saw was Greg Ward, and he not only showed the horse, hmm. but he won the snaffle bit. And that, and when it was over in the middle of the arena, in the background was 25 
of the young champions. And in the middle of that arena was Greg Ward with a little boy, little girl on his lap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a week or two later, then I went across the street with him, and he couldn't eat. He was so sick. No. And then a month or two later, I used to call him. And I think two months later, I called him, and he said, he said, Jackie, I love you. And I told Donna, I don't like that, because a week later, he died. Yeah. So two months before, he won the snaffle bit, a weak person, and then he passed away. He was a great man, great cowboy. It's it just unbelievable. He came to my house, I think with you, Jack, um, when he was down to about 90 pounds. And he was telling me about having this horse called Magic. And he was going to win his last Snaffle Bit World Championship. And when he left, when you guys left, I said to Pat, he'll never make it to that Snaffle Bit Futurity. It was a month or two away. He down to 90 pounds. He can hardly walk. If he did make it, it, it certainly wouldn't be a, a good experience for him. And he goes over there and wins it. One of the stories of the entire industry that ought to be yes. known to everybody and ought to be yes. an influence to young people that want to be yes. champions. When we were in Hawaii in January, Monty took me, he called me Jackie. He said, Jackie, I'm going to win the snaffle bit. I said, yeah, you and a few hundred more are going to win the snaffle bit. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. he did, he won it. Uh, it was amazing what I saw. He was just a tremendous person. You remember what he called me? Well, we used to call you him don't remember. Money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I but don't. he had a name he had a name for me and he never ever ever called me by my actual name. He called me by this name every time. It was Mounty. Mounty. <laughs> Mounty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of great memories on the rodeo team, you and I and him. Oh we, man, <laughs> we had yeah. a lot of fun, honey. Yeah, and uh, you remember Misfit, the bulldog and horse. Yeah, the mare. <laughs> well, here I the remember mare, one the... story. I remember one story that I ate good for a month. There was a sprinter at Cal Poly that could run. Oh, yeah. We figured out who could outrun, could a man outrun a horse, and they had a 100-yard race, and I think that was the horse we ran, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. And we ran Uh, her for 100 yards, and I bet on the horse, and the horse just flew past that (laughs) world-class sprinter. So I do remember that. Yeah, I I rode her in that. I got a picture of, of that race. Yep. Was Greg Ward the sprinter? Wasn't he pretty quick on his feet? Greg, Greg Ward Greg Ward could really run, and we used to match him against other cowboys up and down the road to get money to get the next tank of gas. So, right. and, and he really could run, and he had some trick races that he did with top athletes at these colleges where we went, and uh, he had funny trick races like I'll lay down and uh, – we'll run 50 yards and I'll, I'll lie down and look up the track and then I got to get up and run and I'll still outrun you. But you got to run around this little marker in the middle of the race. You just got to run a circle around it. That's all. And he would pass them every time just as they were making that circle in the race. It takes a lot longer to do that than it does to get up. That's funny. And he, he had a quick way to get up. We used to make 40, $50 every time get the next tank of gas. <laughs> you guys, I love your college stories. I love all your stories, and I and I'm honored actually to be able to, you know, have you both on and and share these stories. So, you know, tell us what they're doing with your property up there, Jack. It sounds like a lovely idea. Well, we've got a beautiful ranch. We we the originally East Bay Regional Park is 110,000 acres in the Bay Area, <clears throat> and originally they came to me wanting. My my place is right in the middle. I've got 40 acres where my barns and horses and home and everything is. They wanted to uh, buy it down the road and make a museum with my 
history and it, whatever. And eventually we kept talking, and pretty soon I said, look, at, I'll sell you the whole place. So we sold the whole ranch, Peace Bay Regional Park. It'll always remain a cattle ranch. They're going to use my place here, my arenas, for uh, horse demonstrations and teach kids about agriculture in the West, which Don and I firmly believe in. So when we leave here, we'll leave here probably mid-May. Then this place there will be with East Bay Regional Park. And we've got a young fellow that is going to kind of take over the ranch who's knowledgeable about horses and cattle. And he'll give seminars out here about about the West, cattlemen, horses, and, and so forth. So we think it's in good hands. People will be able to walk through this ranch, ride around. So we're kind of proud of what we did. Well, we're proud, proud of, of that too, too yeah. Jack. And uh, mm-hmm. you and Donna have have been so inspirational to so many people, and uh, that that ranch will now become inspirational to the next generation. And uh, we're all proud of you for that. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah, give our love to Donna too. I appreciate that. I will. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the Dear Monty, I'm looking for ideas on how to help a horse that is on stall rest and can only be hand-walked post-surgery. He gets so, quite understandably, full of energy that he gets explosive, which makes going for a quiet hand-walk challenging, to say the least, and I don't want him to injure himself or me. How can I help him calm his mind and body? Monty's answer. This is a situation met by many owners. Follow the advice of your veterinarian on substances you might use to help quiet him for an extent that he is safe for you to lead. There is never an easy answer, but a conversation with your vet might suggest that a tranquilizer is necessary. You might think this may be harmful, but I promise that a horse's hoof landing on your head is far more harmful. A good area with secure footing and good footing is very important. Walking in a straight line back and forth is generally a solution, and often there's a hallway or breezeway with reasonable footing or footing that can be made reasonable. And then walking where two walls is discourages bad behavior. That's a possibility. Schooling with the dually halter is an option if the need isn't already a factor. Studying my methods will find the use of the dually halter to be a safety measure practically unsurpassed. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it, too, on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online too, on our forum, and there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, as soon as there is no longer a lockdown. So if you want to be on top of all the dates that we have lined up and ready to go, like June 21, 22, 23, we have the movement. That is planned, and we will be there. But if you need to see what we really have fresh and while you're listening, it's going to be at MontyRoberts.com or call one 688 6288 So we have two ways to know the calendar. These days, it's MontyRoberts.com or call our friendly office at 805-688-6288. For details about today's show, number 158, go to HorsemanshipRadio.com and you're going to find links, photos, and more information about today's guests and topics. We'd love to hear from you. Follow us on Facebook, us being Horsemanship Radio. Facebook, you're going to go up there to the top and you're going to type in Monty Roberts and you're going to click on it and say follow and like and enjoy all the great posts there. 
And Monty is also on Twitter and Instagram, and his handle is Monty underscore Roberts. You can get the app so that you don't miss any shows of the Horsemanship Radio Show or any other. Go to your app store for your Android or iPhone. Search Horse Radio Network and download it today. It's free and easy to use. And you can also listen on your favorite podcast player. That's right. And when you go on those social medias, look for the certified Monty Roberts, the blue check thing and, you know, all the official spites, sites, because a lot of people do add his name to uh, to websites and to Facebook pages. And so you want the official Monty Roberts, right? Right. And many, many thanks to MontyRobertsUniversity.com, too, as our, our title sponsor and to Cavallo Horse and Rider as our show sponsor. Great great support. Be sure to visit all the other great shows, too, on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours.